Welcome back, Trailer Area. This is Note Video number 13 in the Saga of Simple Machines. The last time that we uh, talked, we talked about inclined planes, we talked about wedges, and we talked about screws, and how they're really all the same tool, just used in different ways. The lever is the other main kind of simple machine. And when we start talking about the ones that come after, we can mention how really they're all just either an inclined plane or a lever. But a lever itself is a really, really useful simple machine. It's straight. Right, it's important for definitely for our calculations that the lever is not bending. In real the real life, you know, things bend and you have all these other things you have to worry about and variables, but a lever should be straight and then it's going to balance at some point on something called a fulcrum. Now the whole lever moves when the tool is being used except for this spot. There's always one spot on a lever that doesn't move and that's kind of the key to the whole machine right there. That's where everything happens. You can do a whole lot with levers. You can, you can use levers in really, really different ways. They're, uh, they're versatile. If you think about the inclined planes that we talked about, um, all you're doing with an inclined plane is reducing the amount of force that it takes to lift up a box. There's not a whole lot else that you're going to do with an inclined plane. You know, you can turn it into a wedge and separate things, um, but there's just certain things that you can't do, I should say, with an inclined plane. There's not much that you can't do with a lever. Uh, a lever is really, really useful. Just uh, think about it this way. Um, the machines work by increasing the distance to lower the force, or they lower the distance to increase the force, or they change directions. Those, those are the three ways that we discuss that machines do their jobs. You can do all of those with a lever in any combination that you want, or all of them by themselves, and you just can't do that with any of the other simple machines. I mean, think about, can you make an inclined plane with a mechanical advantage of one? Well, if you tried to make an inclined plane with a mechanical advantage of one, so all it did was change the, di the direction of the force, the hypotenuse side would have to be exactly the same length as that side, and that's just not possible. Good examples of levers are things like seesaws, scissors, pry bars. Uh, we're going to learn next that there's actually three different kinds of levers. And these spots on our body represent each of the three different kinds of levers. And you can see them actually drawn out down here the way that we would uh, draw out levers if we were working on problems. But your head, this joint right here in the top of your skull where your atlas vertebrae sits, that's the what you call the vertebrae on top that the skull sits on, um, it functions as the fulcrum and you have these muscles back here in your neck that pull down on the back of your head if you want to lift your head up in the air and like look at the sky for example. So the resistance is in the front, the weight's in the front, you're pulling down on the lever in the back, pivots in the middle. This is called a first class lever. Other spot in your body that's a lever, right here, everything, uh, your, your leg bone comes down on your ankle joint right here. So this is where all of your body's mass is sitting. All of your body's mass is coming down right on that spot. Well, if you were doing like a, you know, like a calf exercise where you stand up on your tippy toes, the fulcrum's here, all right? The weight is here, but your calf muscle lifts up on the very back of the, the heel bone here. So the effort is lifting up here. The, the load is in the middle and the fulcrum is on the left. See how that's, that's a different setup? This is called a second class lever. And then I bet you can guess what this one's going to be called. Uh, so we have our first class lever, our second class lever, and yet our third class lever. And over here, it's more like your bicep. Uh, the fulcrum is over on this end. That's the part of this arm here, your radius and your ulna that doesn't move. Uh, the effort, the muscle connects a little bit further up on these two bones. And then, you know, you're moving things with your hands, so the resistance is going to be on this side. So you're pulling up in the middle of the lever in this example. That's a third class lever. They all have their very um, distinct uses.
and they're very different. So just a reminder, <clears throat> mechanical advantage. is how much the machine multiplies the force that you put in. So it's going to be your output force divided by your input force. But here, just like the inclined plane, when we actually calculate the mechanical advantage of the machine using the dimensions of the machine, we do it this way. We do it the distance from the fulcrum to the input divided by the dis distance from the fulcrum to the output. Now, also, just like the inclined plane, that might seem upside down. Um, and for the exact same reasons, it gets flipped over if you look at the way that things are moving and you do a bunch of triangular stuff with, with geometry. It ends up working out this way because, remember, this is distance and not force. So it ends up making those similar triangles, and uh, the, the triangles of force are the same exact ratio of, as the distances on the two ends of the lever. Well, not always the two ends of the lever, as you will see. Here is something new. And you're going to probably want to put a big old star next to this um, because we're going to be using this a lot. Just as much as you're going to as you're going to use mechanical advantage, which you're going to use every time, uh, you're going to possibly run into problems where you have to figure out how much the machine is either multiplying your speed or multiplying the distance. So there are three things that you need to know how to figure out with these simple machines. The force multiplier, the mechanical advantage, the speed multiplier, and the distance multiplier. And to figure these two out, you take the reciprocal of the mechanical advantage. Remember what, what reciprocal means for math? If you set it up like this, if you did it to with an exponent, it would be the mechanical advantage to the negative one power. What's that look like if you do that in math? Remember, if you have the mechanical advantage, you take it to the negative one power. Whoop, what was that? Take it to the negative one power, or you do the what's called the reciprocal. It ends up being one over the mechanical advantage. You take that fraction of the mechanical advantage and you just flip it over. So what would that look like? You'll see in a minute. Let's take a look at the three different kinds of levers. The first class lever is the one that has the fulcrum in between the input and the output forces. This is like your seesaw. This is what people typically think of when they think of levers. Now one big question with levers is, does it change the direction of the force? So if you draw a lever, whoop, if you draw a lever real quick, there we go, fulcrum. If I'm going to push down on this side, and I have a box over here, what direction is that box going to go? That box is going to go up. So does it change the direction that the force is going? Absolutely it does. Things that are first class levers are things like pliers, scissors, oars on a boat. Did you ever think about that on a boat? You want to go one direction, you kind of pull the other direction. And we have shovels. Pretty much anything you could typically think of would be a first class lever. These are things that you don't often think of as levers because they're second and third class. And in these ones, the output force is what comes in the middle. So first class lever, the fulcrum comes in the middle. Second class lever, the output force or the effort. You're gonna, there's like three or four different words for what you call the different ends. And rather than just sticking to like one thing and having it be like this strict vocab and that way you wouldn't understand if a test asks you with a different word, um, it's, more to, it's more appropriate to just understand what's going on. So I guess uh, we can break it down. Output, so one end is always the input. The input force end, the input distance end, and that's the end that you are actually operating on. The output force, or the resistance end, um, is the end that the machine is doing something on another object, a box, or typically in these questions, or something along those lines. Um, it's also called effort ends. Um, 
You know, there's a few different names that will slip out whenever we're discussing these things on levers. Anyway, second class levers always end up with a mechanical advantage that's more than one because it's impossible to have the end of the lever with the load on it be longer than the end of the lever that you're holding. Now see how it's the same end? So if I had a big box in here, with fulcrums down here, this distance to my hands has to be bigger than the distance to the weight. This is the only way that the lever can work. So it's impossible to have a second class lever with a mechanical advantage of less than one. And it works because you have to move your hands a much further distance than the object is moving. So you are moving more distance, that means that it requires less force. And you can do a whole lot with levers. I think it might have been Archimedes or somebody that said, give me a lever that's long enough and I'll move the whole world. The thing with second class levers though, is it does not change the direction of force. You lift up, the thing goes up. So wheel bearers, nut crackers, that's how your calf muscle works on that, uh, if you look back at the diagram on the notes of the, the muscles. The third class lever is what you get if the input force, the part that you're grabbing and moving, the part that your hand will be on, the effort end, is in between the other two parts of the lever. These ones, conversely from the second class lever, have to have a mechanical advantage of less than one. Because, for the exact same reasons, the distance from the fulcrum to the resistance end or the load end has to be bigger than the, than the distance between the fulcrum and your hands or where you're actually pulling on the lever because it's in between. So baseball bats, we'll do a few questions with baseball bats, but uh, it's also how fishing poles work and your tweezers. And there's a reason for them. So does it change the direction of the force? No. Bicep muscle is a good example inside the body. So to really appreciate kind of what these levers do, you're gonna to have to work out some math problems. So start off with a nice easy one. Here we have a lever. It's like your typical seesaw on the playground. As a reminder, mechanical advantage is the distance from the fulcrum to the input. Fulcrum, input side. Over top of the distance from the fulcrum to the output. Fulcrum, output side. So three meters divided by three meters in this first class lever would be a mechanical advantage of one. So that means the exact force that you push down on this side is the force that would go up on that side. The only thing this machine does is change the direction. If you move this, this end down 18 inches, this box will go up 18 inches. The distance is exactly the same, the force is exactly the same, it's only changing the direction. Something you cannot do with an inclined plane and with a few other civil machines. So you can do it with a pulley. A pulley is really just a lever that continuously goes around in circles. So I guess that makes sense. All right, so here's a little problem. We have a 150-pound girl who's moving a 600-pound boulder. She's using a lever. How long would this whole board need to be if the end that the boulder is on is one meter long? So she's like, I need to move that rock. I could use that tree trunk as a fulcrum it's about a meter away from where the rock is. Do some quick math in my head. I can estimate how much that rock is. I know how much my weight is. I need to go look for a blank long board to move this rock. Let's figure it out. What's the first class lever? First question, what might the mechanical advantage be? Well, how are we going to figure that out? We don't know the other distance, so we can't do the math, but we know what mechanical advantage does. Mechanical advantage multiplies your force. So if she can push down with all of her weight of 150 pounds and we need to move a 600 pound rock, well that means it must multiply her force enough times to hit 600 pounds. Output force divided by input force, your mechanical advantage. Output force is 600 pounds divided by the 150 pound input force, it's four. So 
this simple machine that she needs to go build needs to multiply her weight four times in order to do that. So if this end is one meter, how long's the other end? Well, the mechanical advantage is the input length of the board divided by the output length of the board. The mechanical advantage is four. We're solving for the input length, this length here. The output length is one meter. That's the part that the rock is on. So four is blank divided by one meter. That would mean that four meters is how long this side of the board is. Now don't fall into a trap where you're like, I solved the problem, that's it, the answer is four meters. That's a mistake, you gotta... My recommendation is this, every time that you finish answering a question, go up and read the question again before you move on to the next question. It's a really simple thing to do when you're answering these kinds of problems, and if you do that, you will catch mistakes that you wouldn't catch otherwise. Sometimes questions will have like, um, two or three things you have to answer and you'll answer one think you're done and move on and then miss a bunch of points but if you go up and just take that couple seconds to, to read the question again you might realize ah there's more to do so let's see how long would the plank need to be if the boulder end is one meter long ah this is not the whole plank that's just that end there's more I need to do so the total plank length would be this end plus this end four plus one she would need to find a five meter long board to move that rock. Hmm, more to the problem. She needs to lift the rock a half of a meter. So if she needs to lift this rock a half of a meter up in the air, how far down is she gonna have to move this side of the board? Well, remember your speed or distance multipliers are the reciprocal of the mechanical advantage. So if our mechanical advantage is four, we use that from the last problem, that's the input length over the output length. If we want to do the distance multiplier, I'll, I'll always abbreviate it this way, distance x or speed x for distance or speed multiplier. If that's the reciprocal of the mechanical advantage, that means it's the upside down version of this fraction. So it's actually the output length over the input length, or just flip the number over, becomes one-fourth. So if one-fourth is what we would get if we took the output distance divided by the input distance, we would get a distance of next line. The input distance, the amount of, of distance she would have to push this down to make this go up 0.5 meters would be 0.5 divided by 1 fourth. She would have to move that down 2 meters. So for every 2 meters she could move this down, the stone would go up another half of a meter. Now, there's a lot of math and algebra and moving around, but just take a second to think about what this means, because really it's the kind of problem that you could just solve in your head, even though it's a whole bunch of steps if you actually work out all of the math. If this device is the right dimensions to multiply your force four times. Now think about how we said machines work. If machines raise the force, they lower the distance. If they raise the distance, they lower the force. So in order for the machine to multiply your force four times, you're going to have to give up in the area of distance. So it's going to reduce the amount of distance four times. And that's always going to be that kind of same relationship there. So if you reduce two into fourths, you would move half of a meter. Here we got a baseball bat question. We have a baseball bat, it's a meter long. The person grabs the bat about six inches away from the fulcrum. The fulcrum is the very bottom of the bat. Uh, that doesn't mean that that's where the hands start. That's kind of like where, where the most amount of force from the two hands combined I uh, just kind of estimated there at the bottom of the bat. So if the person's grip applies the average force there about six inches away from the fulcrum, which is at the bottom, and strikes the ball 0.83 meters away from the fulcrum, which is right on the sweet spot, if you know anything about baseball, 
you hang the bat a certain way and tap on it, you find the spot on the bat where all of the harmonics work out perfectly and all of that energy goes back into the ball. You don't waste any to like the vibrations that end up hurting your hand and that kind of stuff. You can hear it uh, when someone hits the ball with the, with the sweet spot. So what would the mechanical advantage of this bat be? It's a useful thing to know if you're a baseball player. Well, the bat is a class three lever. The mechanical advantage is always gonna be the input distance divided by the output distance. Our input distance would be where the, where the, uh, the effort is. It's where we're actually you know, using the machine. So that's gonna be this distance here of 0.15 meters away from the fulcrum. That's why that's there. The ball is hitting the bat 0.83 meters away from the fulcrum. Remember, the fulcrum is on the bottom. Hands are in the middle. Ball is going to hit up here. So the distance from the ball to the fulcrum is going to be bigger than the distance from the hands to the fulcrum. So 0.15 meters divided by 0.83 meters. Our mechanical advantage of this bat is 0.18. It's the first time that we've seen one that's less than one. What's that mean? Does how is that helpful? Because it would have to be greater than one in order to add more force, right? Because if, if I'm putting five newtons of force in and the mechanical advantage is two, I'm getting 10 out. I'm doubling my, my force. I'm, I'm stronger. But with something like this, it's not. It's actually cutting the force down. I have to use more force than I should. Well, how is that helpful? Well, it's because of the reciprocal. You don't use third-class levers to get stronger. You use third-class levers to get faster. All right, so here we go. This is a cool question. Division one baseball championships being held in PNC Park. Baseballs are 5.125 ounces, that's 0.145 kilograms. Pitcher throws a baseball, 40 meters per second, really fast pitch. He hits the 90, mile an hour, 90 miles an hour mark. Casey Shaler, Titan varsity baseball player. Casey is at bat. Casey, though, doesn't just want to hit a home run. He wants to hit a home run in style. He wants to be one of the few people to hit the ball the 135 meters it needs to go to make it land in the river. He wants to be one of the river guys. Well, he paid attention in physics class, and he's done the math, and he's trained for this moment. He knows that when you hit a ball with a bat, the contact time it's really tiny. It's 0 .0007 seconds. That's all the time that the bat and the ball are, in are, are actually touching each other. So all of that force, all of that energy that goes from one object to another when you do work has to happen in that amount of time. He also figured out, because of projectile motion, that in order to make the ball go from home plate the 135 meters to land in the river. We got some angles here, so we're not going to actually work out this math. But the ball would have to come off the bat at 49 meters per second. The initial speed would have to be 49 meters per second, which is 110 miles an hour. If he could hit the ball at just the right angle with the bat going 110 miles an hour, going to crush that ball into the river. So how do you accomplish this? Well, what's the input here? Well, we're not talking about force. We're trying to get the bat to go fast. Well, the best way to do that is to make your hands go fast. Anybody who's a hitting coach will tell you it's all about hand speed. You want to do exercises to get your hands to go fast because that's what a bat does. The bat makes your hands even faster. just how fast. Remember, this is our bat speed. Our bat speed has to get to 49 meters per second. Let's just remind you up there. 
we need to know the reciprocal of the mechanical advantage to figure out the speed multiplier. How much is this bat going to magnify or multiply the speed of my hands? Well, if the, if the mechanical advantage is the input distance divided by the output distance, remember it gave us this really small number. You take the inverse of, I'm sorry, the uh, um, reciprocal of that to get the speed multiplier. So the speed out divided by speed in. Remember, if it's mechanical advantage, it's force out divided by force in. If it's the distance multiplier, it's distance out divided by distance in. Well, if it's the speed multiplier, it's speed out divided by speed in. Remember, it's, it's this ratio of what you put in to what you put out. So if the mechanical advantage reciprocal is 1 over that number, well, 1 over 0.18 is going to be speed out, which is the speed of the bat, 49 uh, meters per second. How fast will the speed in have to be? How fast will the hands have to be to make the bat go this fast if this is how much it's going to multiply my speed? So we'd have to do 1 divided by 0.18. If you do that, you get something a little bit over 5. We can rearrange stuff. We can move the speed in on this side, move this over on this side, do the algebra there. So uh, 49 meters per second divided by 5.5555555555, which is what this is. You have to move your hands 20 miles an hour, or 8.82 meters per second. So in training, if this was something like you wanted to do, Casey's like, I got... I got six months, I got nine months to train for this. We're gonna get there, I'm gonna blast a ball in the river. Does the math, starts his training to speed his hands up to 20 miles an hour. Because if you can't do that, you can't hit the ball in the river. So, hand exercises, swing, you don't have to, don't have to go to the batting cage all the time, just you know, lift weights, do those specific ones to train the speed muscles in your arms. He connects. Crack of the bat. Hush falls over the crowd. Ball lands in the river. How much force would you have to put on a ball with a bat to make it fly out of PNC Park and land in the river? You can figure that out. Force. As soon as I said force, F equals MA should have popped in your head. Well, we're given the mass in the problem. All right, so we're looking for force. We know the mass. What we don't need, or well, I'm sorry, what we don't have is acceleration. So we gotta figure that out. Well, how do you figure out acceleration? You know this. You need the initial speed, you need the final speed, and you need the time. It's final speed minus initial speed divided by the amount of time that it takes. All those values are given to you in the problem. The final speed is 49 meters per second. That's how fast that, that um, ball has to be going off the bat to fly out of the park. Well, what's its initial speed? This is where it gets a little bit interesting. Why is it negative? Think about that. And then this value over here is uh, the 0 .0007 seconds that we talked about earlier. Why is the initial velocity negative? Well, that's because the ball is initially going this way. And it needs to then go this way, 49 meters per second, in a really tiny amount of time. So its initial speed is in the opposite direction of its final speed, so its initial speed is negative. This is where those vectors come into play. It's also why it's velocity, it's not just speed. It's speed and direction. So if you do 49 meters per second minus a negative 40 meters per second divided by 0 .0007 seconds, you get this like crazy ridiculous big acceleration of 127,000 meters per second squared. If you slow things like this down with like really high speed footage, it's awesome to see what happens 
in this point zero 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 seven seconds. The ball like hits the bat, the bat comes around, makes contact, and the ball just like flattens. It totally changes the shape and it looks like it's made it's filled with like gel, like that kind of like squeeze gel you would have. And it re and then it snaps back and that that snapping back action makes that thing just shoot off the bat. It's like a springboard. It's like those those little toys that you um, might get, it looks like a suction cup and you flip it inside out and you lay it down and it cracks back and it jumps up in the air. Like that's what's happening. It deforms and then it snaps back. And that's one of the things that like when you des when they design and make baseballs, like that's where you could lose some of that energy transfer. Um, so you want that like the baseball to be as efficient as possible. You want the bat to be as efficient as possible. Um, that's why metal bats work better than wooden bats and all that other stuff. So now we have a force, I'm sorry, now we have a mass, we calculated the acceleration, multiply them together. If you hit a ball hard enough to fly out of PNC Park and land in the river, you would de be dealing 4,000 pounds of force on that ball. That's almost the exact weight of a car. Typical car. Grab the average car off the street, 4,000 pounds. That's awesome. Simple machines make you, okay, they give you superpowers. Super fast, super strong. It's one of the reasons that uh, humans have become so successful. It's our tool use. So we have 13th booby trap coming up. 13 questions on levers. Be ready to identify what kind of lever is what. Know how to do the mechanical advantage. Know how to do the distance and speed multipliers. Know some examples, like if I give a real example of a lever, be able to say which kind of lever that is, like a wheelbarrow, that kind of stuff. And uh, don't forget to go do the exit ticket for some breakfast problems. Have a good one.